The year is 1903. Poor Austrian boy Victor Lustig was scavenging for food outside of a Budapest hotel when he saw a rich couple leaving after dinner with food still on their plates. And that evening somehow changed Victor Lustig forever. I decided that anyone who could afford to leave plates of food while others starve did not deserve to keep their fortunes. So I vowed to dedicate my life to the pursuit of cash and beautiful women. I don't really know what that means. Perhaps no one knows what it means. But it's provocative and it gets well, people going. going. Went from beggar over pickpocket to burglar and conman, he mastered every scam in the book and slowly worked himself up the social hierarchy of the 1920s. At a party in Kansas City, Victor met Roberta Norrin and married her a couple of days later in November of 1919. About the line of work he was involved in, he said, I'm not doing anything illegal. I just help people that do illegal things to do illegal things. Yeah, it's probably somewhat illegal. They were traveling together as Count and Countess Victor Lustig, Mr. and Mrs. Eric and Kessler, C.H. Baxter, Rudolf Harbiger, Victor, Victor Gross, Frank Gardner, Herman Keller, Helmut Stroll, and Pierre Duval. He had a quick spell of selling stolen bonds on Wall Street, and during the Prohibition in the early 1920s, Victor used his European connections to make a fortune importing expensive booze into the US. He then realized that he could make a lot more money if he just made shitty booze in the US and put European labels on the bottles. And so he did. But then he came up with an even better scam, the Romanian box. The scam would go like this. Whenever he was on a transatlantic crossing or party and talked to other wealthy people, he would single out one person and tell him that some scientists came up with a chemical method of duplicating money with the help of a device called the Romanian box. That guy who made that box sought asylum with Victor's father after a revolution and died eventually. And so Victor now has the box. He would then take a hundred dollar bill and a blank piece of currency paper and put both of them into the box. Then he would uh, push some buttons and uh, turn a crank and the bill would be duplicated, serial number and all. He would even go to the bank with the people that he scammed and it could be verified that it's real money. Victor would sell these boxes for $25,000 a piece or $350,000 today or $700,000 in 2023. The only catch, he told the victims, was that the chemicals would need to rest for 18 hours before using it again. And that's the time Victor had to skip town. Because the actual catch was that the box obviously couldn't duplicate money. Victor just had a couple of thousand dollars in freshly printed $100 bills, which had serial numbers in sequential order. And he only doctored the last couple of digits to be the same. One time, one of the people he scammed saw Victor in Chicago and ran up to him. He shouted, Hey, hey, Victor, hey, your box. Doesn't work no more. Uh, d d did you wait for more than 18 hours? Yeah, about that. Oh, you fool. You probably destroyed the machine. However, you, sir, are in luck. You may pay me 25,000 for another one. The other gentleman replied with the words, Huh? This is an obvious scam. Please go shit in your hat. Except he didn't, and of course he bought another money box. And so did two owners of a pool hall in Chicago, a businessman in Kansas, a gambling syndicate from New York who gave him $46,000, and a banker from California paid $100,000 for it. Most of these people Victor scammed had no legal recourse whatsoever. I mean, what are they gonna say? Mr. Police, there is a guy who wanted to sell me a counterfeiting device and it didn't deliver. You bought a counterfeiting device? Huh. You know what? Never mind, I shall show myself out. That's not to say that Victor never got caught with any of his schemes, but he always managed to bribe or charm his way out somehow. And if you want to know how to do that yourself, let me tell you about Mans. Well, actually, Victor has got you covered because he wrote down a list of 10 commandments for con men, which will make anyone as irresistible as that kid named Tyler landing a bottle flip while dabbing in 2015. Step 1. Be a patient listener, which is basically the good boyfriend rule. Step 2. Never look bored, which is the someone tells you about their dream rule. Step 3. Wait for the other person to reveal any political opinions, then agree with them, which is the how to make friends on Twitter rule. Step 4. Let the other person reveal religious views, then have the same ones, which is the being a 4 year old with religious parents rule. Step 5. Hint at sex talk, but don't follow it up unless the other person shows a strong interest, which is the as if I had a choice rule. Step 6. Never discuss illness, which is the I have a very unhealthy relationship with my doctor rule. Step 7. Never pry into a person's personal circumstances. They'll tell you all eventually. That's just being an introvert. Step 8. Never boast. Just let your importance be quietly obvious. Again, that's just being an introvert. Step 9. Never be untidy. That's the no fun rule. Step 10. Never get drunk. And that's just the no fun rule with extra steps. With these simple 10 steps, you are bound to be as successful as Victor, who in 1924 alone, a time before commercial airliners, traveled to New York, Chicago, Detroit, Kansas City, 
Montreal, Boston, Paris, Berlin, Munich, Italy and Spain all in one year. At some point, Victor's wife, Roberta, said, enough is enough and divorced her womanizing conman husband in 1925. In the same year, Victor went to see his daughter under the pretense of taking her out for ice cream at the local parlor and instead took her to Paris and hired a full-time maid to babysit her at a hotel. Then, in Paris, Victor met up with Dapper Dan Collins, a well-known criminal. As they were sitting in a cafe, Victor saw on the front page of a local newspaper that the community was angry about the rising costs of maintaining the Eiffel Tower and how it was seen as a useless monstrosity. And so he had an idea. With the help of his criminal network, he managed to get a hold on official letterheads and started to invite the biggest scrap metal dealers of France to meet with him in person, in his hotel room, and told them that he was working on behalf of the government who wanted to scrap the Eiffel Tower. But of course, they couldn't do it immediately, so they wanted to give the job to the highest bidder instead. After meeting with each of them, Victor gave the quote-unquote job to the party that gave him the biggest bribe on top of the money they were bidding. The next morning, Victor and his accomplice, of course, ran away. More specifically, they ran to Vienna, where they waited for all the newspapers to break the story of the century. But the man who stole and sold the Eiffel Tower. And they waited. And they waited. And they waited. But the story never broke. Victor theorized that it was because the guy who won the bid was simply too ashamed to go public. And so Victor thought, I'll do it again. And sold the Eiffel Tower again. Maybe. Historians aren't quite sure about the second time. But he did it once. But this time he fled to America. Where he ran into his ex-wife after effectively kidnapping their daughter. And so she married him again a couple of days later. Well, in 1928, Victor stole some money from a guy and fled to Europe. Then he counterfeited some money in Paris and fled to the States. He evaded authorities in the States and went back to Paris. Counterfeited more money, got caught, bribed his way out of jail and went back to the States. There he met William Watts. To guess what? Exactly. Make more counterfeit money. In fact, they were so good at it that a judge later said that Victor was like some other government that also issued US dollars. They sold their fake $100 bills for $30 and made millions. Victor's lifestyle now mostly consisted of making money with scams, scheming, gambling, traveling between the US and Europe, juggling a wife, a child and a high-profile mistress, while fighting extradition and a dozen of detectives on his tails. But it all came to an end on February 27, 1931, when he was arrested on his way to the US from Mexico by Sheriff Q.R. Miller, who had previously invested $50,000 into fake stocks Victor had offered him. While incarcerated, Victor talked to the sheriff who explained that he was in debt because of Victor, to the point that he had secretly taken money from the county. And so Victor managed to sell him a money box. And the sheriff set him free. However, the sheriff realized that he got scammed again and followed Victor to Chicago, where he held him at gunpoint. And so Victor said, Okay, 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 you got me. Here, have $50,000 to pay off all your debt. The sheriff was happy, Victor was gone, and of course, a couple of days later, the sheriff got arrested for possessing $50,000 in counterfeit bills. However, after forming a special victor Lustig unit consisting of police, secret service, treasury department, state troopers, the bomb squad and Dora the Explorer, victor Lustig was finally arrested on 10th of May 1935. And then I kid you flippin' not, he literally made a makeshift rope out of his bed sheets to climb out of his window and when guards saw he climbed down, he pretended to be a window washer. And that somehow worked and he was out of prison. At this point, he was an absolute legend in the media. The miracle man of crime had more than 30 arrests without convictions over the years and now he also managed to outright break out of prison. After about a month on the run, Victor was finally caught again after a car chase with the police where both cars crashed and Victor came out of the wreck with the words, Well boys, here I am. At the trial, his accomplice Watts testified, and after listening to him for about 15 minutes, Victor said, All right, let's get it over with. All I wanted to see is whether the rat would squeal on the stand. Victor stood up and yelled guilty and was sentenced to 20 years in Alcatraz. And then he died in 1947. What a legend. 
If you like this video, subscribe to my channel. Thank you to the thousands of new subscribers. This week has been crazy for me. Thank you to all you patrons. Thank you to William, Jack O'Sullivan, and DW. Thank you for your kind words. And if you want your name to be next in the credits of all of this channel's videos forever, do what these lovely people did and become one of my first 100 patrons. Anyways, thank you all for watching. Have a lovely day. His wife and daughter were now poor, of course, and worn out by life on the run. However, a short time after his death, envelopes with money came in, and apparently some of Victor's scams and pulling of strings made it so that after his death, his wife and daughter would at least be left with a lot of money. Which was, of course, very cash money of him.